I've known Michael Earp for quite some time and Michael is a writer, he's a bookseller and he's a book champion and he's quite a modest fellow so I'm going to have to poke him about some things to get him to tell us. He spent over 17 years as a children's and young adult specialist in book selling and in publishing and he now manages Melbourne's little book room. He writes his own things but he also is an advocate for LGBTQIA. Did I get those the alphabet right yeah you got them all there and throw a plus on the end <laughs> i'm a shocker at remembering the order and you know it's said with pure love but he also uh contributed to and is the editor of kindred 12 queer love oz ya stories and a contributor to underdog love oz ya stories both released in 2019 he's working on other projects he does all sorts of other things we're going to find out about. But Michael Earp, it is so lovely to see you, my friend. It's so lovely to talk to you. It's great. <laughs> I know you've got a master's in children's literature. How did you make the journey from being a bookseller to a writer? I don't know. I, my passion for books came late, I guess. I mean, I've always, I was a big reader in primary school and then pretty much stopped reading in high school uh, as Many people do. Um, stereotype. <laughs> I am a stereotype. And on top of that, um, I, I did probably another stereotype of uh, writing a lot of terrible, angsty teenage poetry. So that was my, um, how I began my writing journey, I guess. But I never thought I'd make anything of it until I started working in a bookshop. And... I uh, discovered my love of children's literature and then thought, well, I really want to write for kids and so and um, young adults. And so I thought, well, I can either go study writing and come out the other end as a penniless writer um, <laughs> or um, I can do something that will give me a career uh, to pay the bills while I write. And so I studied early childhood teaching um, with the design to be a, a teacher while I write. Um, during that, I learned that I don't have the temperament to be a teacher. And that so, surprises me because I thought I um, was listening to you and thinking you'd be a lovely teacher. What didn't you like about it? <laughs> um, I find that I have no penchant for discipline and keeping people in line. And I would be overrun by almost any age group that I tried to teach. Okay, um, that's a slight problem. That is definitely yeah. a drawback. Um, I, I thought that if I ever did teach, I'd want to be in the naught to twos room uh, where it's just you're looking after babies and playing with babies all day long. That's where I felt most at home. Uh, but in the end, I realised that I was working with books and that's actually much more of a joy for me and so as long as I was working with books that could be my career and I didn't actually have to go change my world I just focus on what I do well. So you started selling in bookshops and then you ended up selling for a publisher how different was the change in experience from a bookshop talking to the public to then selling to the bookseller? Um, it was it was quite different and in some ways a huge relief for me because I, um, when I was in bookshops, I was the children's specialist. Uh, and so all I wanted to do was sell children's books, but most bookshops, you often get caught up selling other books as well because you get called into other sections and have to help customers with general inquiries. And so I, um, when I moved to working for Walker Books, which is a children's publisher, um, all of a sudden, all I had to do all day long was talk about kids' books with other people who passionately loved children's books. And so, um, and I, it wasn't a chore. Uh, when, you, when you're a sales rep for a books, like for books, uh, the people in bookshops need what you're selling so it's not even you're not even fighting this resistance like people actually want 
to look at what you have to offer and talk about them because they're usually passionate about books too as they work in a bookshop and so yeah it um there was a lot more freedom uh, making my own schedule and um you know meeting my own targets and that sort of thing and so it was just quite a yeah it's quite a different approach to book selling absolutely now are you going to toot your horn or are you going to make me try and remember the exact title of the award you won <laughs> Please take oh, your home. I, well, I twice won. <laughs> Thank you, um, good boy. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, ABA Victorian uh, Sales Rep of the Year. So uh, that was voted by booksellers around Victoria. And uh, it was lovely to win that two times in a row. Especially because having seen you from both sides, like as the bookseller and as the rep for Walker, you are passionate about it. And as an author, knowing that you were selling our books, it was just, you felt really comfortable and you knew they'd be well looked after. So it was lovely that booksellers saw you the way that we did. So it was exciting. So I'm glad you fessed up to that. Well, it's, um, it's the same with repping as it is in the shop. I don't actually feel like I'm selling because I just rave about books. And if that convinces someone to buy a book, then so be it. Uh, I. Like, I don't see myself as making a pushy sale. I'm just like, oh, this is fantastic. Uh, like, I loved it and you'd probably love it too. So yeah, it's, it's a sneaky way to make sales, but uh, that's, it's just the way passion works, I guess. Exactly. And that's what we want as a, as a buyer too. You want to know that someone's passionate about the book. Now, you're back in a bookstore and what a bookstore to be in. What made you leave publishing to go back to selling books in a bookstore? Um, the driving. <laughs> that's that's the, basic, the basic answer to that. Um, I was spending uh, three to four hours a day on the road. Um, and because you're driving, there's pretty much nothing else you can do in that time. And so while it's necessary for the job, I personally found it a waste of my time, even if I was doing the same job, but being able to use those that time to do more of the job, uh, I would enjoy it more. But I just got to the point where I was, yeah, I felt like I was wasting too much of my life in traffic. The little book room, which is where you manage at the moment, during the COVID crisis, the energy that you guys put into your store and into books was absolutely incredible. How hard was it to stay positive, not knowing what was going on? Well, um, I mean, it was quite worrying. We had no idea. We, uh, we were all um, quite panicked at some stage, as most people were in many industries. Um, but particularly arts. But uh, we just, we also just knew that unless we adapt, unless we rise to whatever challenge this is and try and service people in within the parameters that we had in front of us, then, um, you know, there were, it was, it was either that or give up. And like none of us at the little book room, we're, we're a pretty small team, but none of us, uh, are like easy pushovers and so um we we just did what we do best which is find ways to get books into people's hands and adapt and you did it beautifully yeah. and continue to do it beautifully with the books having all those books around you i know you have a passion for patrick ness but has your passion for any particular author widened being back in the bookstore um yeah, I mean, I have plenty of favourites. Uh, <laughs> um, Patrick Ness is just one of many, um, as you can probably see from my bookshelves behind me. Actually, I'm um, wondering, is that Sean Tan behind your ear? Is that a Sean Tan, Tan print? Yes, that's, uh -huh. um, it is a Sean Tan print. And actually, I was about to mention Margot Lanigan as being oh. another one of my passionate loves. Um, and... A uh, funny, I'll keep it brief, but a funny story is that I bought Tender Morsels knowing nothing about it except being in love with the cover. 
Um, and then it sat on my shelf for years unread because I just didn't get around to it. And then I thought I really should read that. And that, then it quickly became one of my all time favorite books. And then it wasn't until years later that I was flipping through Sean Tan's um, Bird King and other sketches that I found an early draft sketch of the Tender Morsels cover. And that's when I made the connection that it is a Sean Tan cover. And so one of my favorite illustrators illustrating the cover for one of my favorite author's books. And I just knew I needed it as a print. And so um, that's what that is. Oh, a print of the tender morsels. Beautiful. Cover. When you were young, before you turned into the typical teenager and stopped reading, what did you read then? What were your favorite books? Oh, Teen Power Inc. Emily Rudder. <laughs> um, <laughs> in fact, um, at Little Book Room, we've recently discovered that uh, four of us, so pretty much the entire staff, uh, have um, all thoroughly enjoyed Teen Power Inc. as kids. And I, I, I even have an entire Emily Rodder shelf and have collected all of the Teen Power Inks. There's 30 of them. Oh, and wow. I've managed, I spent my 20s collecting them. Um, and we're going to start a campaign to try and get it back in print because we think they're fantastic. <laughs> oh, go for it. Because, yeah, they are fabulous. Although I must admit, Rowan of Rim was my favourite. I love Rowan. That was a great I story. loved Rowan too, but I didn't read Rowan until I was in my 20s. Mm. And then I also read in my 20s the Del Toro quest. And I just think she perfected what she was trying in Rowan of Rin in Del Toro quest. It was so good. Oh, Del Toro was great. I was an adult reading that too. And the poor children that I taught, I'd shove it in their face. You've got to read this. <laughs> You've got to read it. You've got to exactly. read it. Exactly. I'm sure I terrify them. So with your, as a writer now, tell us about Kindred um, and how it's gone. Um, it's been really nicely received. Um, uh, it's almost, in fact, this month, June, by the time this gets released, will be one year since it came out. Um, my beautiful kindred. I, um, it's been such a fun journey uh, over the last three years since I started working on it. Um, and working with such a fantastic list of authors, um, like, I find it very easy to brag about Kindred because most of the work is not mine. Like I ushered it into the world, but there's uh, 11 other brilliant authors in that, in that collection. And I'm just so proud of it. And so proud of the reactions it gets from readers, um, people who I have, I once had a friend who's a librarian in a high school um, message me and say that a student, had returned it to the library and said, thank you for stocking this, I feel seen. And oh. it's, it's that kind of thing that I hear these little snippets of and it's just so uplifting to know that it's, it's doing what it was designed to do, uh, highlight an entire, you know, minority of people that they exist and that they're valid. And so I think it's wonderful. I think the beautiful thing about that is too, that's one kid you've heard from and you could probably bet there's 20 you haven't heard from more and the impact you're having. So it's important. Now you are a strange beast. You got an Australia um, cancelled ground. How the hell did you do that? <laughs> oh, I, um, I'm not really sure. I, I found myself feel, um, stressing over that application for months and months and months and having a few mental breakdowns over it. And then um, finally getting it off and thinking, I've asked for far too much money. There's no way that they'll ever give this to me and then getting it. And so that was incredible. And that was specifically to tour uh, with the authors to writers festivals around the country. Um, so we were really lucky and got to um, six or seven different festivals. Um, and then uh, COVID hit and we had uh, about five or six cancellations because festivals just having to cancel and travel being um, stopped. I was stuck at the end with 
a little bit of money that was supposed to go to those uh, getting to those festivals left over and so what I decided to do was uh, run a giveaway and so I've basically got a uh, hundred copies of Kindred uh, and uh, it also covers postage and so I'm running a giveaway that will um, hopefully get Kindred into the hands of young readers all over the country. What that is, now again you really clever way of adapting to circumstances out of our control, go you. Yeah well the the grant was to let people know about Kindred and so what better way than to put it in their hands. Exactly. Well done. So what are you working on now? Um, I, funnily enough, just got another grant. Um, <laughs> Stop it. You're going to have to write mine now. <laughs> um, I got a City of Melbourne quick response grant uh, for the creative arts sector. Um, and so basically this has allowed me to reduce my hours at the bookshop. Um, so I'm now there three days a week. And the rest of the week, my time is paid for uh, to uh, write a junior fiction series. Um, so I'm, it's a little bit different for me, but I'm absolutely loving the process. Are you enjoying the age group? Because um, a lot of your work, I know you've done picture books as well, but a lot of your work has been a little bit older. How are you enjoying the junior fiction? Um, I'm loving it. I'm, I'm basically trying to uh, reflect into the world my own version of all of the junior fiction that I love. Um, so I like, I want to take the tone and the, I mean, make, yeah, it's definitely my own story and my own thing, but I just, I am such a big fan of reading junior fiction and middle fiction because of what can be achieved with less, uh, just because there's less words uh, doesn't mean the ideas need to be simpler. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's basically just this very sweet little mystery, small town um, mystery and like nothing, nothing bad happens. It's wonderful. <laughs> Oh, enjoy it. That sounds great. Do you find it hard? Because I know you're passionate about the bookshop and you're passionate about writing. Do you find it hard to have to balance that? There must be days where you just want to stay in the bookshop or days where you want to just stay writing. Um, always. Uh, but until, like literally until this grant, um, which only kicked in last week, so I'm very new to having paid time to write, I've just, it's been a necessity for me to fit my writing around full-time or even more than full-time work. For example, when, when we had to make all those changes at the Little Book Room, uh, we were all working six days a week and some of my days were 10 to 11 hour days. And so um, I was getting very little writing done in that time. Uh, but that's just an example of when I was working with for Walker or in other bookshops, I just had to write on my weekend. In fact, my regular routine um, is uh, getting up at six. Um, I try, I don't always succeed, but I try to do 20 minutes of yoga. Um, and then I eat my breakfast and sit and have an hour to two hours, depending on when I'm starting work. Um, that's my writing time. And I can't even rely on evenings because I'm quite social. And so I, I need to schedule in time with friends in order to give myself downtime. Otherwise, I'm just go, go, go constantly. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm still doing a little bit of work in the mornings and sometimes in the evenings. But now I've got these days that I can dedicate to working on on writing uh, is just wonderful. That's fantastic. How do you write? Do you handwrite or computer? I um, do lots of sort of random uh, incoherent jottings um, when I've got an idea, um, but uh, sometimes when I'm writing a short story, I'll handwrite the first draft 
but I don't tend to handwrite first drafts of longer work because um, it just it just adds a step basically. So I'm uh, yeah I tend to work at the computer, and um, then it's ready to manipulate. I I do like I mean depending on what I'm working on, but um, uh, most of the time I like to know the structure, the plot before I start. Um, sometimes I uh, will spend a lot of time plotting before I even put the first word on the page. Uh, and then with the first book in this junior fiction series that I'm writing, not only did I spend a lot of time plotting, I then um, didn't actually start writing until I had the first sentence right because uh, like it's all about tone with junior fiction and so unless you capture someone right from the very beginning they're probably not going to want to keep turning the page and so uh, yeah I struggled a lot to get that first sentence right and once it hit I was like this is it and then I was able to just go on from there um, but then once I've got in a draft out and I've edited it as best I can. Um, I workshop it with my writers groups. I'm, um, I'm currently in uh, two writers groups. Uh, one that I've been in for about three years now um, and they're fantastic and supportive. And then another great one that I specifically set up because um, I wanted to be working with queer writers and getting a queer perspective on my work as well. So I, I have a general sort of kids and YA writers group and um, we affectionately call ourselves the Scribble Maniacs. Um, and then uh, I'm also in a group that we call ourselves uh, Queer AF. And then <laughs> okay. that means author friends. Uh, As so. faces. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know what you mean. Michael, yeah. just before we finish off, I, I said that you're a champion of children's and young adults literature, and you really are. Would you like to give a push to your um, brunch group? Because I think that's a really important thing for people who love books that might be interested. Sure. Um, I just run a, a very casual book club. Uh, we meet in the city once a month. Um, and just have brunch and talk about young adult books specifically. There is no set book that we read. And so, yeah, this is just the third Sunday of every month. Um, there's no set book. We just talk about what you have been reading. And some of us don't read a huge amount. Like sometimes I have half a book or a few pages that I have to add to last month's discussion but then someone else will mention a book that I read years ago and all of a sudden we're having a big discussion on that or who's read this and who hasn't and what should we stay away from or what do you have to get on board with immediately? And it all generally happens over brunch in the city in Melbourne, but uh, we're the last few months we've been doing it via Zoom and so we'll probably do the next one via Zoom too and then hopefully we'll be able to start meeting in person down the line. We're chatting this week because you have launched something very new and exciting. Would you like to talk about it? Oh, yeah. I just, um, <laughs> oh, just yeah. got a shiny. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I, there's so much going on in my life and my head. Sometimes I forget what, what project people are referring to <laughs> when they say <laughs> things like that. Um, I have just launched my shiny new author website, uh, which... I'm very impressed with. Uh, it was designed by Jin and Co, who I know is a popular choice for authors, um, but I'm thrilled with his work, their work. And um, I, I think it's like professional, but not corporate and colorful and like gay, but not like screaming in your face. And I don't know, I it, it's got everything that I wanted uh, down to a T. So um, I'm thrilled. To coincide with my new, my new website, I'm also, I've started up a mailing list and um, I'm going to just keep people up to date with what's going on with me and 
occasionally send out a short story that's just for people who have subscribed. And I've actually set it up so that when you subscribe, you will automatically be sent a short story written by me. So uh, if you want a little sample of my writing, that's a free way to get one. Thank you, Michael. And if people would like to talk to you in the bookshop, Little Book Room, and I can thoroughly recommend Michael's recommendations. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> yes, well, I, I just rave about books and I think I have a pretty good hit rate. You do. You do. You haven't failed me yet. Not at all. It has been <laughs> so nice to see your face and I'll look forward to seeing you soon. And thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me.